it's a pleasure to see you again after so many years. Same to you. Uh, for someone that does not know you, do you want to start by introducing yourself, maybe saying what you do here at university, what okay. you study? Uh, okay, my name is Fernando Alves, um, also known as Mr. Alves. Um, well, my, my, my family name is Ferreira Alves, actually. Um, I am a lecturer. I teach at the uh, School of Arts and Humanities, um, Arts, Science and, and Humanities at Ominho. I've been lecturing for the past 20 years, I guess. Um, I teach, uh, basically, I started teaching a, a specialized translation and I was also in charge of the traineeship internship program back in pre-Bologna uh, um, uh, degrees. Um, so, and, and then I, I, I specialized in translation studies, um, also in translation tools and technology, um, sociology of translation, and I, uh, well, my, my cup of tea is actually specialized translation, technical translation, and also professional issues associated with the language industry. Right. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time because mm -hmm. I've done the, the courses from yeah. in you as an yeah. extracurricular at the mm -hmm. time during my Portuguese studies. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I learned a lot from you. And yeah. one thing yeah. I wanted to discuss was that mm -hmm. methodology, because I'm going to be a bit rude now. Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> and say that I did not learn anything or saying that you did not teach me anything. Right. But I learned a lot from your classes. Okay. And that's the difference where I want to m go and where I want you to hear your opinion. Okay. Since I feel that you did not teach me anything mm -hmm. in the sense that you did not give me any answers concretely. Okay. But you, I learned a lot in the sense that you made me see where I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Or you pointed out where my worldview or my approach to translation was wrong. Mm -hmm. So by pointing out my errors... You opened me, opened my mind, and okay. you allowed me to evolve a lot. I really learned a lot, and I was wondering if you feel that this contribution could be similar from your perspective, or actually, what you feel is your contribution to your students. Okay, that, that's that's a, that's quite flattering for me. Um, uh, it, it's 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 really um, impressive to have this. Um, input from from your side um how long was it when you were my student it was 10 years ago maybe 10 years it ago it was i think in 2011 12 we were together for two or three years yes. so it was around okay. 11 12 uh, around you're, you're you're quite quite right and and that's a challenging question for me because sometimes i don't know what i'm doing here uh, th honestly, it's, it's... That's for all of us. None of us know no, no, what no, we're doing yes. here. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's like Monty Python's uh, 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 meaning of life. What, what are we doing here? But... Mm, 42. Th the sorry? answer is 42. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah but anyway, um, um, I think um, there, there is a problem of in interaction and empathy with, with, with students. Um, I know that, um, well, in my classes, um, I try to um, give this worldview or this professional view of um, how to cope with a competitive uh, society uh, where people coming from the language, a language background, humanities, are quite often discriminated. Why? Because, um, again, uh, our students have this idea that um, it, it, you only need, it's only necessary to master uh, a couple of languages. And the main uh, languages. The, the main yeah. language in, in the course or in the degree program. And then that's it. Um, and from my experience, I, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I, I haven't started my career as a teacher. I started my, my career as a professional thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, as, as a specialized translator. Yes, I, 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 started, um, I, I started my career as, um, as a translator helping my father in the, F, in, in the um, 
Motor Grand Prix, like F1, mm -hmm. or also karting, or kart. But what were you translating back then? Then I and and, and then rallies. Um, um, so what what was I translating? Um, when I finished my 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 degree, um, I started lecturing, and also I started my own translation agency uh, with with a partner. Um, and both of us, we were trying to get the gist or understand the, um, the, the, the industry, also how to be professional in providing translation services. And then my father, um, he used to, uh, to speak French because he comes from a French background where French was taught at secondary education. Uh, and the moment the Portuguese, the uh, Rally Vinglo Porto, started uh, being um, worldly known, uh, is that fine? Okay. Um, he invited me to be his interpreter. Right, live interpreter. Then. Live interpreter. So yeah. m my my job was to interact with uh, drivers, mechanics people from the field uh, associated with automotive industry and sports. Um, so I, I, was, I, I was translating with drivers like Carlos Sainz, Colin McRae, uh, Ayrton Senna, well, he didn't, right. he, he, he didn't need it, it, but Schumacher, for example, Alan Prost. Uh, and, and, and suddenly I un understood how to cope with pressure, how to cope with stress and also with quality and uh, requirements associated with providing uh, 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 some service. Because I realized that, that there were people there who were quite, well, more proficient than me mm -hmm. in their field. My only added value was to be able to communicate uh, effectively. Uh, language but the moment i realized that that there was this click or bonus associated with okay uh it, it you you may um speak a language but the moment you understand the specialized or specific domain field and you enter the, this sort of of community um you you will be a better professional so uh, th that's that's my idea of um, and, uh, uh, how how to cope with, with with pressure, stress, time management, also yeah, effort that. management, and so on. But, but sorry, but, but f for me, it's it's more important to be able to adapt to a, 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 to specific professional fields or domains than being able to uh, speak fluently because that's not enough. In the end, could it, would it be fair to say that you want to do, especially in live translation, because it's very hard, yes. you have to, the stress is real, you have yes, to, of course. like you, in paper, if you get stuck on a word, you can think about it, but of in course. live, no, yes. you have like the eyes on you of and course. you have to, of course. so uh, in this sense where you cannot really hesitate at all. Sure. Sure. Do you think that the most important is just to cr construct a meaningful narrative or a meaningful communication rather than being super loyal translator, like super pristine translator? Yes, that, that, that's, that's right. You, you, need, you need to adapt to the circumstances. You need to um, make decisions. Uh, for example, um, and, and that's the other point of, of, of my approach in, in terms of teaching uh, methodology. I started... Like you said, being, well, I don't know, rude or um, quite objective in terms of, of, of requirements, uh, skills, abilities, uh, posture. Um, um, that's okay. Uh, um, but now I'm, I'm looking at a, a deeper level of, of reasoning associated with that. With Be that, specifically with what? With, with, with the way, for example, we process information, we make decisions uh, fast, um, um, we, we, we choose the best options for our uh, um, translation, we 
like I said, adapt to, uh, to different ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Um, we change our focus or pitch according to the circumstances. We read our client slash customer. Uh, we read our, we interpret our audience. Um, and th- there's quite a lot involved in this process of providing uh, language. Uh, um, it seems uh, some sort of emotional training, like read the cues, yes, read yes, the context yes. and adapt to that context. Of, of course, of, of course. And, and I, I think, well, I'm, I'm not a Darwin, Darwinian uh, uh, and, and I'm, but sometimes I'm, 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 I use that metaphor in my classes because it's not the survival of the fittest, but it's survival of the person who is able to interpret and, and, and be more competitive. Right fast, efficient, um, and, uh, and, and, and reliable. But in this case, we're still talking about live translation because the fast, yeah, we, the speed. We are, no, no, no. It, we, we are talking about live translation, like interpreting, but we are talking about uh, written translation also. For example, um, uh, when 10 years ago, I, I didn't use machine translation in my classes. Today, I don't know what I'm doing in my class. Because I, I'm, I can't teach translation mm. as such. Because my students are two steps ahead. Um, they use Google Translate, trans- translate Memsource, uh, DeepL, or uh, and other um, tools, technology, resources. So what am I doing there? Uh, I, I, and then I, I realized that... Um, language service provision or translation service provision is changing rapidly i I don't like this idea of everything is going too fast Uh, uh, but well uh, there's a booming or soaring uh, market and things are going up are you are you disagreeing with the idea that things are improving or the market prices are going up which which way is the web prices are not going up on the contrary you mean in translation services? Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, um, subtitling, amateur translation, non-professional translation, this grey market affecting the translation industry, uh, localization, for example, collaborative platforms, uh, all this idea that we are, uh, we are all in, involved in this huge network uh, where everything can be... Uh, provide it for free uh, as long as you are a cool guy and you want to add some extra value to something just look at google and and, and facebook uh, if you read this piece of news and, and then there's something asking do you want to have this translated into and then you uh, you select this translation and then you are invited to comment on or correct the translation and then you are feeding the beast, uh, uh, which is uh, the the well artificial intelligent neural machine translation, and then suddenly your option choice suggestion is being used in the future in in uh, identical or similar uh, situations where the same phraseology term sentence is being looked up right is that a bad thing in your perspective no it's not it's not a bad because it's a normal feedback i would say it's a normal feedback yeah. but for example m- m- our students are, are not aware of that uh that um uh, you your uh, effort is being used for a higher uh, uh, <laughs> higher world order <laughs> yes um and, and I'm, I'm i'm not looking at this as sort of well we have this schizophrenic uh, 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 world where there's something up there and it, we are being controlled everywhere but we need to adapt to that because for example uh teaching just specialized translation or translation as such um is is is, is not enough uh, you, you need to, for example, teach um, different skills like post-editing, editing, dealing with quality, 
um, it, it, it's not a, a, a matter of looking at this masterpiece of, tr of translation looking l like l like Adonis or, or, or something, looking at the beauty idea, but you, you need to balance things and decide, okay, this is average, this is it, okay, according to this audience, but what can I do to add this plus thing to something which is being given by a machine right now you're assuming that the machine will always be the starting point and when yes. i was studying 10 years ago this was not the case and we can go in a bit more detail later okay what changed during this 10 years during this last decade during the algorithms and that i think that changed massively the field of mm -hmm. translation mm -hmm. but let's for now mm -hmm. assume that human translators are needed so mm -hmm. let's focus on how to teach uh, human translators okay right and one thing that changed a lot my approach to translation was when I abandoned the literal view mm -hmm. that we all have at some point. We, yeah. That's how we learn languages. We start yeah. this sentence, not yeah. translate it almost literally to language B, and we develop our understanding from there. So yeah. before I started your courses, I had a very literal mindset. Mm -hmm. And part of your contribution was telling me like, this is wrong. And I said, okay, then I started not to be so literal okay. and it expanded my mind. And one idea that also changed profoundly how I saw it was to understand that languages are not static. Mm -hmm. Languages are not perfectly equivalent yeah. between each other. Yeah. Languages are a vehicle for thought. Mm -hmm. And the way that cultures see the world depends on the context of that yeah. culture. Yeah. So we will not have a perfect match, but rather there's like... You divide reality into blocks, mm -hmm. but the blocks are not perfect. Yeah. Some blocks are roughly the same size, some are different, some don't have connections, and mm -hmm. you kind of have to make this match between yeah. the blocks yeah. imperfectly. Mm -hmm. That's why you come with the question of quality and so on. Yes. And uh, for me, translation became a way to not change the words, but to communicate the idea yeah. that the language is tries yeah. to convey. Yeah, that, that's quite true. One, one of the major problems my students are people, also with people reading translations, because uh, you, you need to educate not only students, but also consumers or people uh, using, reading, um, interacting with translations. Um, and that, that it, for me, it's the most difficult aspect. Uh, communicating how this idea of literalism, which, which is okay, okay. Uh, in translation studies, we have this idea, um, literal, non-literal, and we tend to associate that, okay, um, literal is, is good, uh, non-literal is bad, but it also depends on the text types. For example, um, you, we, you tend to associate non-literal or free translation to poetry, literature, other domains. And then suddenly um, you tend to associate the, um, literalism to specialized technical tra translation. But that's not enough. Yeah, I don't think that's accurate even to begin, since you cannot categorize it so of separately. Of course. Since even in a specialized translation, you try to be literal as much as possible, but sometimes just the word that language one language has, the wording, the way it's structured the yeah. sentence is yeah. not going to work yeah. in the language B. So you need to be non-literal. Of course, and, and, and thus the need for training students to identify those cognitive decisions that you take according to each text type. Is like as if you had a, a specific toolkit, or a surgeon, a, um, a surgeon or a doctor or a mechanic will have a specific set of tools, not skills, mm -hmm. tools, um, and these tools will help you will help you to um, adapt or use a specific um, uh, strategy to sort or solve 
a specific question. For example, um, in Portugal, um, we, we, we don't we don't translate Piccadilly Circus, right? But we could have trans a circus is a rotunda, it's a roundabout. So you could say, okay, when visiting London, don't forget to uh, go to rotunda the Piccadilly. Right. Okay. Right. And then because it's a literally correct. Yeah, it's it's literally it's, because it's a roundabout. Roundabout. It's circus, circus, rotunda, and okay. So how come this uh, chunk is being used for for ages uh, to describe this tourist spot, and people are used to using um, the loan word, okay, empréstimo, right, of Piccadilly Circus or Oxford Street. Isn't in this case a matter of context and culture? Because people, yes. it makes more sense to use Piccadilly Circus than to use the Portuguese equivalent. Of course, of course. It's, it's, like, it's like paella, paella. The Spanish word, yeah? Yes, but I, I usually, um, I, I use this example in my classes to demonstrate that um, you, you can accept both. For example, um, if I invited you, I invite you to be my partner and we want to open a paella restaurant in Braga. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know or are not familiar with the Spanish, paella is a Spanish dish that involves rice, yellow yes. rice with turmeric, uh, I think. Seafood. And seafood. Seafood and, f and meat also. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to open this restaurant yeah. in Braga. But, but, but you, 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 you could choose uh, pizza with double Z or one. Um, if, if, I, if, if I invited you to be my partner, okay, let's, Andre, let's open this, this nice, really nice paella restaurant uh, in Gualtar. Um, if um, we, um, if we go to the um, um, Loja Cidadão, like the citizen shop, citizen where shop to register it, to maybe? register our company, our restaurant, they will write something there. The minutes of the, uh, of of our um, uh, mm, our idea, idea agreement, yeah, our project, and our project, and something will say like Andre and Fernando are uh, opening or will be opening uh, my. Um, fiscal number, your fiscal number, and so on. Um, and then suddenly um, they will open a restaurant in Braga specialized in serving paella and other. So are, what your point is that they will use the word in the original Spanish? No, I, my point is that, for example, in a legal, according to a legal setting, institutional, corporate-wise um, setting, audience, typology, domain specific. I think the paella with LH Portuguese style would be used there. Like, like in the Portuguese Gazette, Liar da República, okay? But if we start publicizing our services here at University of Minho, will say, please come and taste our tasty or uh, nice paella. And then suddenly we will use the double L, right. maybe in italics also, to have this extra distinctive flavor. Right. So the, the issue or the argument you're making, it seems to be the question of communicating. So yes. for the official services we will use the portuguese adaptation because it doesn't really matter for for example for, for example yes yeah, but then for the students we will use the exotic form not, of the not, 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 not students or sure, the it's, community it, it, it's, whatever it's like, it's like bacon from the sky right to sing do céu bacon from the sky i had yes, no idea it was yeah, going to be that ba bacon from the sky or nuns nuns belly barriga de freira oh, okay I no idea, the, 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 well that seems so weird to hear that yeah, in Portuguese, of course, in English. Of course, I mean. but the, the problem is that there are so many translation, 
blunders where mistakes are being detected that it it it, it is it, it is quite uh, it, it's a joke to share this and some of these are associated with uh, the difficulty to convey the, the and and to adapt the communicative effort to a specific audience more than the difficulty is also i think the inadequacy yeah. and let me explain I feel that since language is about communication mm -hmm. and since translation is about communicating something in one language to mm -hmm. something in another language, mm -hmm. the focus, again, is not on the literal no. transportation of words, but on the transportation of meaning. Yes, of course. And I see this error at the soci societal level mm -hmm. often in which sometimes we have words for which there is a perfect understanding mm -hmm. and they are still translated, yeah. for example, online. So mm -hmm. this resource is online. Yeah. In Portuguese, we, we write em linha. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for me, it always strikes me because who doesn't know what online means? For me, I see em linha and I'm like, what the hell is yeah. this? Yeah. Or website, mm -hmm. um, or even when there was this movement about the open access. Mm -hmm. In Portuguese, it was translated as acesso aberto, yeah. which is literally open, like you open a door, but mm -hmm the meaning will be something like access live like mm -hmm. a free access mm -hmm. so it's about this and i feel that when these words come up i believe that it's an error of approach since they do, do not need to be translated of to course, begin with of course and 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 the, the, that is quite important when trying to communicate um with different um with different domains with different target groups where right. People are not expected or used, not expected, are not, they are not used to reading that. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that the customer is always right. But suddenly he is right. But our uh, also approach is to show that, okay, you're right, but there's another option for these, for example, um, it, it, it all depends on the type of text, as I said, or the type of situation, communicative situation. Um, uh, you may add a footnote, for example, or add something in parentheses just to explicit, make it explicit for another uh, reader. Um, By the way, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to comment something on the footnotes. Is it in normal translation, the footnotes, are they seen as a bad thing? Since I have some experience in subtitling mm -hmm. and they are usually seen as something to avoid because they add clutter to the screen. Yes. Okay. In, 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 sub, in subtitling, uh, it's, it's, uh, people are not used to finding or, uh, or adding footnotes, but in literature, but also in technical scientific, um, um, texts, they are useful. They, they are not only useful for communicative, informative um, reasons, but also for identity. For right. Like I say, this is my work, like a sort yeah. of signature. Yeah. Like this uh, is my this print, is my, my imprint. As, as a translator. One of my students found a very interesting um, example. Uh, well, probably 10, I think 10 years ago, uh, we were, um, well, I, I, like to, I like to do applied research in, in terms of translation studies. I have this project with my students, which is called uh, Translation Around Us. Uh, and and we, uh, I invite them, I ask them to look at translation as a, for example, um, the type of information we find here in a plastic bottle or water bottle. Uh, it's, is this literal translation, uh, 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 what is being used here as a text, instruction, um, components, technicalities? Uh, and one of my students was uh, doing research at the Escola de Economia, the School of, of, of Management, Economics and, and, and Management, um, here at the university. Uh, and, uh, the, he was looking at how the library of this um, um, organic unit, um, well, how many translations 
you found in the library. And then um, he discovered this interesting uh, book, a translation of one of those macroeconomics uh, handbooks. Um, boring book. <laughs> boring. And th there was this example of um, something the author was was uh, uh, describing a situation like um, this Liver no Liverpool uh, uh, playing Manchester United li like this like Porto Benfica the Manchester like yeah. we were discussing like, before. yes <laughs> so um, the yeah. derby derby yeah. um, uh, scene okay um, and then the the example in the source text was um, okay uh, imagine Liverpool was playing. Uh, Manchester or right. I don't know. okay and I, I don't know which club won Liverpool or Manchester but the the translator decided to translate this and add his footnote mm -hmm. or imprint or signature saying that okay in Portugal I am a Benfica supporter so this would be something like Benfica, Porto, but Benfica would have won. Yes. So okay. he wanted to capture the rivalry between the clubs. And yes. he adapted the rivalry to the Portuguese context yeah. with the Portuguese clubs. Yes. It, so it, he, he did a good thing. He went to the emotional it, it, side. He did, did, did a good thing. Uh, okay. If, if, you, if you read this according to the scriptures or the theoretical domain, the, the, people will say, okay, uh, this is wrong. Uh, he shouldn't have distorted the meaning, but he had this click or pitch uh, 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 notion that he was targeting a... He, he was translating something designed for students in Portugal, and yes. students in Portugal would identify themselves with that situation. It's like, for example, Os Sete Samurais, right? The Magnificent Seven. The, magnific the Magnificent Seven uh, movie comes from uh, Ran, from Akira Kurosawa, mm -hmm. okay? Os Sete Samurais. So, n then suddenly, but we're talking about cinema, we're talking about theater, but there's this adaptation of cliches. Right. In movie titles, it's about something else because it's usually about marketing, how you position the world. So yeah. I feel that in Portugal, they always invent a lot with the titles. Yes. Complete. But in the case of the translation, specifically of the text, mm -hmm. I feel that it's not right or wrong by definition. It depends. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the question that is more at stake is... If you maintain the original, what is the percentage of your audience that will understand it? Of course. Understand the emotion and understand the idea and the meaning that the author is trying to capture. Mm -hmm. And is that percentage higher than the percentage of those that do not understand it? Mm -hmm. And is, the is that percentage of those that understand it the same? Or do the people understand at the same rate? as if you use the original, mm -hmm. as if you didn't use it. Mm -hmm. So like, does you translating change it? And I believe that it depends a lot on context. Of course. For instance, in this case of the Portuguese rivalry, of the football rivalry, mm -hmm. if it's um, Manchester United against Manchester City, yeah. it's probably obvious because yes, they're close sure. from sure. the same town, sure. there's a sure. long history, but if it's some local derby that I don't even mm -hmm. cannot name, like some two clubs from yeah. some neighborhood mm -hmm. where you, the majority of the population yeah. does not know, yeah. then I think it would make more sense to translate mm -hmm. to Portuguese clubs yeah. because no one will actually understand the sure. rivalry. Sure, sure. And um, this is something that I feel that can extrapolate to the to translation in general. Like, what's of the course. percentage of people? Like, it is it worth it to yeah. translate? Managing a translation project is like uh, peeling this onion. Th th there are different layers. Yeah. Um, in, in translation studies or translation, translation theory, you have this uh, idea that um, either you bring the reader to the audience or you bring the audience to the reader. 
okay? Schleiermacher you, you used, used to say that. And, and all theories about translation are associated with this divide, taking um, sides. The audience to the reader or the reader to the audience? Yes. But isn't the reader the audience? Uh, it, it, it depends. Because you translate something for the reader, it becomes your audience. It, it, it depends. Suddenly, it, it depends on the level of distortion that you bring to the text. Look at the... I'm, I'm, I'm not a media expert or drama expert, but look at the adaptations of Shakespeare. You, you can rewrite or restage Shakespeare today in Ukraine, right? Yeah. But what you, what you are doing is uh, bringing the author to the audience. Okay. But you, you, you can do it the other way. It, 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 it depends, for example, adaptation of classic uh, um, myths, for example, mm -hmm. texts. Um, it, it takes sort of quite a lot of compromise uh, 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 and, and, and balancing this because otherwise it tends to be a caricature of the source text. But also otherwise, for example, in, in translation studies you have other um, uh, notions like, uh, two notions like domestication or foreignization. They come from Lawrence Venuti. Uh, he has this this book called the translator's invisibility okay could you explain briefly what they are about yes these two uh, terms you, you you can either uh, domesticate or foreignize to domesticate is to um it, it's like domesticating a, a dog right then you 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 bring your worldview to the um to the text Okay. Right, so you adapt it to the modern times in case of yes. uh, ancient plagues. Yes, yes. But you can do it otherwise, the other way. It's like foreignizing. And foreignizing means that you're adding something extra, sometimes coming from the source text to make it readable, adequate, to the audience. For example, um, th there was this idea in the 18th century uh, about les belles infidèles. Okay? As belles infiées. Les belles infidèles, they mean that, well, imagine Louis V or the, the 15th and, and Marie Antoinette and, and so on. Okay, Ver Versailles. They used to adapt um, Greek drama to a 18th century audience. But imagine Ulysses, Achilles, and all the Greek heroes being depicted on stage with those long yeah, the twigs, <laughs> the twigs, and uh, makeup, and suddenly, Ulysses and all those heroes were a caricature of this. But the the audience w was expecting that, right? Because for them, that was a normal representation of a human being. And the the, the, the and, and the question the, the 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 word is actually what you said, norms. Because in translation, people underestimate the role of norms. Norms are conventions. For example, uh, one, well, a century ag ago, for example, um, Walter Scott, okay, this, this Scott uh, uh, writer, he, he had this, um, I use this in, in, in my classes. Um, one of his novels is called Quentin, Quentin Durward. It's a name. I found this in my uh, 
Grandfather's Library, the translation, um, from beginning of the century. And this novel was translated into Portuguese as Quintino, Quintino, Der Word. Okay? It's like uh, Paul Alves, Paulo Alves. Yeah, yeah. So he changed the name to the Portuguese form. Right. My question is, uh, if we watch a Tarantino's movie today, will you be, will we be call, calling uh, uh, Quentin Quintino Tarantino? For sure not. And again, it's yes. a norms, context but is meaning. Yes. Everyone knows him as Quentin the, already. So Of, of uh, course. Of course. But one century ago, or and it all depends on the conventions, on the way society is um, expecting something to be uh, translated, depicted, communicating. That explains why Oxford was Oxonia. Really? I never, yes. I'm not from that time. Yes. I have Oxonia. no idea. Cambridge was Cambridgia. Well, are those even Portuguese words? I've never they, they, come they across are, them they, in my they, life. They, they, just try to Google this Oxonia. It looks like a deodorant. Uh, <laughs> uh, Oxonia, uh, Oxonia and Cambridgia. So back in those days, it was, it, it's like Asterix uh, uh, um, comics, okay? Uh, Lutetia, Lutetia is Paris. So there were, there were names for this and the trend or the norm was to have everything translated right. domesticated domesticated into portuguese and that's why and suddenly you have this idea that okay prince charles prince carlos uh reina isabel elizabeth but then suddenly harry mm, harry mm, okay it's eric no kind of, it, i think i don't know that's henry oh that's henry oh uh, yeah henry but, that's no but, name <laughs> okay but suddenly the, the, there's this confusion yeah, yeah. about what and, and my students ask me okay why why do we translate this but we don't translate that it's a hard question to answer because you cannot answer it's a community answer it, it's, and it's feeling an intuition yeah. and th th that's what I, I feel i think it's important to teach this awareness and people being able to um taste words and um and 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 and, and contextualize them and look at the way they are it's like paella uh, or, or or pizza uh, they they um they have different feelings associated with according to the if, if i invite if I, if I invite my girlfriend and we, we want to have the a romantic dinner um during Valentine's Day, and okay, let's go to this pizza uh, restaurant. It's, it's it's pizza with double Z, and it, it, it's it's uh, it Italy and wine and so on. So, yeah, the, and and my feeling is that it's difficult to translate this in terms of cultural. More than difficult, the question is: Is it necessary? No. In this case of pizza, no, for sure, and. Yes. Uh, the question for the words or the names, most of the times is not necessary, I also feel. And again, it comes down to the question of the percentage of, of the community. And in a way, we are dealing with a translation right now as we are having this conversation. Yeah, sure. We are two Portuguese guys sitting in a university in Portugal yeah. and we are speaking in English. In English yes. And this is something I often think about. Mm -hmm. Like, should I have my podcast in English or in Portuguese? Sure. What is my audience? What is my community? And maybe if I were recording 20, 30 years ago, I would never speak in English. Sure. Since most people would probably expect French as international sure, language sure, and not English. Sure, sure. So why the English? In my case, I would say it's English because I try to target the international community. Sure. And I assume that people that speak Portuguese also speak English mm -hmm. or can understand English yeah. if they yeah. cannot speak. So it's a question you adapt to the context. Yeah, that, that's that's my. When I started working with my father, um, 
that was basically the the the, the point. Uh, we, we needed we needed to have this international global lingua franca, mm -hmm. where drivers. Well, it, because suddenly we have this prejudice, and and some of my colleagues are, they really resent this uh, from other languages, of course. They really resent, and they they are quite angry at the domination, world dominance of English. Angry, um, angry and, like jealous. It, it's, it's not je It's jealous, of course, um, and and suddenly. People tend to live in the past where everything was idyllic and things are not that anymore in specific settings. When I, when I tell my students, okay, languages are not enough. Your B2 or C2 English is not enough because students here at university are having courses in English, School of Economics, here, Instituto de Educação, Psychology, Sciences, and Engineering. Those students, undergraduate, they are being taught to write scientific academic papers in English. So, what is the difference between a language student and a science or engineering student, the, that's why in my master's degree, most of my students come from different backgrounds and they are quite proficient in the, well, language is okay, but the technological, terminological approach is accurate f for them because they are using the in, specialized. In this case, these are students that are not studying translation by default, but they are doing their own degrees in of economics course. and then they take classes with you of as course. like extra, not extracurricular, no, but not, as part not, of a complete education. No, no, no. The, 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 these are students, for example, from sociology, from law, from economics, and they want to, be tra to become translators. Uh, what I'm giving them is the methodology to it's this theoretical background, like, okay, uh, you have equivalence, you have ad adaptation, you have different strategies, techniques for dealing with different, like the toolkit, okay? You have norms, uh, you need to use terminology, you need to use um, uh, phraseology, you, you need to look up words and be consistent, coherent, and so on. But then... Uh, uh, they will have the specialized knowledge. So how do you think that language students can keep up with them or be relevant still? People that are not, they don't have the technical background, but are just studying language yeah. and probably then have to later learn the technical. The type of learning that you had when you started this conversation with me, I didn't, I didn't teach you anything, but you teach, uh, but you learned problems or problem solving strategies if you want to be uh, you if you want me to be honest with you um, and I really don't know uh, um, and I really don't know what, what I think is that language is not enough uh, language is not enough of course culture is okay literature but that, and this but this professional approach interpersonal skills um, communication, um, skills, um, terminology, um, knowledge, specific um, um, domains. They will be useful. One, one, one of my one of, of the problems with my uh, degree, um, for example, apl applied languages, is is that our students are really good professionals but they lack this cultural literature approach because suddenly our students are becoming quite effective in terms of job or process, uh, um, production process as part of the production process, but they don't 
ask questions. They they don't. Uh, 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 um, yeah, think about the stuff. Retrospect. Uh, about Can you stuff. then say that they are becoming successful professionals if they don't have this contextual adaptation or this interpretation that every translator needs to have? Uh, if they are becoming bad, prof uh, good professionals or bad, pro or, or they may be. Not if they are becoming good or bad, but you started phrasing that they are excellent professionals, yes. but they lack this. So, can uh, you say that? Yeah, um, they. Are, I I would say that they are quite good professionals, but they run the risk of being easily domesticated by industry. Right, so uh, they you are. You understand what, what, what I'm saying? Is, is I that, think that, so. They can get be uh, easily framed. Yes, is that it? Yes, that's it. And and it, you need to be. They have this rebel, um, uh, irreverent uh, uh, side. Otherwise, you'll be too obedient, and you will you won't be happy. And w one of the things that that I find when speaking with my students or former students, it's it's a question of happiness. Are they happy doing what they do? And since the language industry landscape has changed so much, and because of COVID and, and so on, people are intro, intro, shy, they don't communicate, they lack these interpersonal skills. Um, and they will be easily framed, as you said, when put in a situation where you have this organizational structure like, okay, this is a translation agency, you will be part of the uh, uh, scheme. Um, it, it's like... A, like yeah, I, I uh, understand. Like you are, have this role that you're expected to fulfill yes. in a specific way. Yeah, yeah. and they, they, they will be really nice uh like charlie chaplin uh, in in this um, conveyor belt um. i don't i understand what you're saying in the sense that they will not be happy if they uh, conform all the time so yes. they need some irreverence to be happy but my experience my very short experience mm -hmm. in the translating field for agencies in the industry, so to say, because mm -hmm. I translate it a lot on individual as a freelancer, like mm -hmm. technical tests, but I only had one brief experience with a translation agency and it was very bad. I was working after a bit after my graduation. I was, I tried to work uh, in f fan subbing. We had some fan subbing projects. After that, we, I went, actually, I, I say we because I had a project with a guy, but then the project did not go forward in terms of professional, but short long story short we ended up working for a translation agency doing subtitles mm -hmm. and we were both very good at subtitling we had one of the best in national terms in fans i mean we knew, we knew our worth and i had your mm -hmm. the training f from you so i knew i was very good not perfect i had my flaws but i had this sort of non literal approach all the time like i try to be literal when i can but mm -hmm. sometimes See. Yep. Especially when you're translating shows, TV shows, mm -hmm. you need some degree Idiom of flexibility. And idiomatic also. And uh, this company named PSP Produções, I have no, sh no shame naming them because they deserve shame. And they, in the end, they said, uh, your text has too many errors, we're not going to pay you. And I translated like two seasons That's and it. even my friend, he also That's did, it. and we did not get paid. That's we it. worked for free. So I like that's a shame. I'm happy because I was quote unquote rebel. I was not quote rebel. I was I think I was being a good translator and my texts were good to some degree. You're quite right. But he said no. Bye bye. You know why? Because it it, it has to do with being vulnerable. Not only with the uh, professional approach to the market, the job or the employer on, on the employer side. But I, I don't want to make this like Machiavelli, like good and bad people. But 
some of the companies they use this power structure where they take things for granted and they try they try to frame not frame but but uh, criticize translations based on non-scientific or subjective or bad intention i don't know at that time i felt it was completely arbitrary it's since arbitrary. i saw the errors i was like this is not an error that's that's why that that's why does the need to develop this competence or skill associated with traceability accountability empowerment and being able to respond to criticism on a objective basis framework that's why for example you have you have a an iso standard 17100 designed to well um, uh, describe or, or or frame the all the translation process okay like this framework where you, you have the concepts like project management and but suddenly you are being confronted with discretionary approaches from agencies and they do not conform with these stereotypes but also it has to do with quality because quality is subjective of course but it's not that subjective you, you can have different ways or views of quality you can have this idyllic um, uh, idea of, of quality you have you can have a functional uh, idea of quality but you have quality metrics metricas okay and then suddenly you are expected to uh, categorize your mistakes in drawers okay this is terminology this is language this is style and some agencies they use this sort of excel like uh, like a spreadsheet where they are adding notes to your mistakes and suddenly they confront you and they say okay andre you made 10 minor mistakes here you made 12 major mistakes there so we were expecting 100 percent performance from you and now according to you to our beautiful spreadsheet um your um, output will be 70 percent so we are not going to pay you 100 but we are going to and then you are involved in this kafkian uh, um, uh, attitude where you are being asked to justify your mistakes and deal negotiate meaning with people who are not able to categorize a mistake I wish they had done that with me, since it would mean A, that they would have the spreadsheet and yes. B, that they would pay me 70%. Yes, in that's my, it. But that's not it in my case. In my case, there was not that sort of categorization yeah. and I got zero payment anyway sure. for all the work done. And then they went on and they published the show. Sure. Almost exactly as I sure. had it. Sure. And that's, sure. I don't know if it was bad intention i don't want i don't know if they wanted to default on payment since they abused that power as you said i felt very vulnerable when dealing with them because you basically send an sure. email to them sure. okay i'm gonna work here sure. yeah they say yeah yeah sh for sure work with us we're gonna send you some tests okay you do the test mm -hmm. okay you, you do good now we are going to send you one or two seasons of some show to sure. try yeah. in the end we'll pay you x per line mm -hmm. okay okay but it's everything very vocal. There's no contract. So course. at the end, and the, the default on the payment, and I'm like, sure. what can I do? And, and can I go there? And, and no. students, students, and, and students finishing their de degrees are quite vulnerable because the market is 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 different. You can find people like that agency, but in and 
for example, if, if you go online and try to sell your translation services, there will be a myriad of, of opportunities for you. And then you'll be bidding the lowest price. And then what these people do... Well, to be honest, um, I was also uh, a victim of that scheme. Um, well, 10 years ago, I was teaching my students to be uh, professional, attentive, accurate, and uh, responsive, and, and, and uh, be, at, at, yes, be, be on, on the lookout uh, to those sort of uh, schemes. But I myself um, was asked to do this translation test for a uh, publishing house. And I started translating this on Confucian uh, philosophy, and I did my best. And suddenly they uh, replied and they said, OK, uh, your test is quite good. Uh, you'll be uh, added to our uh, list of translators, so in the future you'll be contacted. One day I was having coffee, Saturday morning, and reading Publico, and they have this uh, um, um, section dedicated to philosophies of the world, and my translation was there. And they did not notify you? Of course. Oh, they use so, your free work. And, and, and then I realized, Fernando, you are being uh, quite um, naive, right? Because you, you, you relied on this person on, 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 on the publishing house and, and, and the, the, oh, the, the reputation and suddenly those um, schemes were being uh, used. Yeah, it's like the someone who never fell for it that froze the first stone. Yeah. We all are victims of it. The question is to watch out for the future and, and to be aware of this position of power that sure. they have, that they can ask us things for it's, free it's power. for a test it's power. and then they use it it's power. for their uh, own benefit. For example, um, a typo. Uh, I ha some of my students uh, uh, are being criticized and they won't receive the, um, the payment just because someone, uh, like sort of control freak, um, detective one or two typos or double space and they will confront the professional saying okay and then it, it's not the one thing is to say okay you, you did a good job but there's this problem the other thing is to label you as a failure a bad professional because suddenly they will say Tapesim. It's awful. It's a bad translation. It's a shit or whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, it's okay. You can curse all the ones. But, curse free environment. But uh, th that, that's the problem. They say, we want to work with you because this is rubbish and so on. And, and the person will be um, humiliated. And w this person will have to justify or account for the feedback and it will this person will lose money and time because the time you spent trying to argue or defend your position with them was time and uh, time yes, consuming absolutely and you, you you didn't work you you refrained from working to other clients and you were invested all your time to uh, respond, answer something with people who are not able to. Absolutely. I come exactly about your framing of the criticism. When I was in the book I'm reading, I'm reading a book by David Coleman mm -hmm. called Emotional Intelligence. And the chapter I was reading yesterday was exactly about how you communicate criticism. And he was arguing that when someone does something that is not good, and you go and say, you shit, that's awful. Mm -hmm. When you attack the person and not the work, the effect is inevitably to demoralize the, yeah, that people. You demoralize, they lose hope, they lose, they become frustrated, yeah. depressed. And what he was arguing is, if you want to give 
feedback or criticism in a manner that encourages and stimulates. First, say what you did. Like you did. So to finish the reasoning, first say what you did, then say what you don't like about it mm -hmm. and then say how you, the person can improve. So you start yeah. to formulate a plan. So instead of saying you are shit, mm -hmm. it's more like you, you had too many typos. Mm -hmm. This is not good for production, but I believe that you can, Im you can sure. correct them. Sure. Sure. Just something like this. Sure. And instead of the yeah. person feeling, oh yeah. my God, I don't want to work for you ever again. You say, okay, I'm going to do better. I'm going to correct and I'm going to um, improve. One of my favorite, um, w well, I, I like to use humor, uh, and, but one of my favorite arguments, uh, I, I like to argue with, with the revisers and proof edit or proof readers from publishing houses. Um, I, I had some really interesting, well, if it was today, I, I wouldn't be so, so abrupt and, and um, but, um, but one of, I had one, one uh, argument with um, someone from, from a publishing house and, and it was like that and we were just discussing and he was trying to undermine and, and, and underestimate my, it, it's not the question of me being a, a professor because it's, that, that, but I, I really uh, knew that my job was good. And you, you was using qualifiers, adjectives, which are quite, quite offensive. To uh, you, not to, to your you. work. That's the thing. To like me, he was yes. attacking the person and not the he, work. And, 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 then, and then I said, okay, give me examples of my mistakes. And it, it just had this cloud or nebulous approach. Mm, there are some inconsistencies. I said, but what are these inconsistencies? Well, he was using terminology and... I was trying to uh, uh, make make him frame these according to categories. Okay, is this a lexical question? Is, is, this, is this a syntactic error? Is it agreement? Is, this, is it language? Did I say overon? Did I say yeah, yeah, whatever? Yeah, a grammatical but error. It, yeah. it, it, you, you need to categorize. You, you, you cannot say that a typo is exactly the same mistake as overon or... Uh, okay. In Portuguese, so, it's a grammatical error. It's, it's yeah, a conjugation. Grammar error. is one thing. Typo is a format. Is another thing. So you need to have different levels of um, conceptualizing and describing errors slash mistakes. It's not the same. And and if if you if if you see for example justify text, okay. If if you don't to justify this, you will open a Word document and you, you see that the text is always uh, aligned on right or left or whatever. Is it a mistake? Of course. Is it serious? I don't know. It's just a matter of select all and that's it. What is the problem? <laughs> but in this case, do you believe that he had a personal agenda at, at you or was just a bad no. reviser? Uh, or a bad it, communicator in this sense. No, it. Uh, I, I guess it was. A, it's not. It was not a personal agenda towards me, but it was a personal agenda towards the translator. Because in 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 agencies, you have the power relations associated with the jobs tasks that you are performing. In other words, ego. In a, no, no. No. Since oh, okay, I I need to point out the yeah, faults in you because, because I'm better than you. Because you are. You are working for a publishing house. You are an intern. You work there. You need to justify your salary. And suddenly you have this prejudice against translators that translations are always bad. And suddenly there's this translator and you need to point out mistakes. So it's the person who is trying to uh, criticize someone, sort of outsider, based on assumptions which are not correct. That's like, like subtitling, for example. People don't know how subtitling is done. And 
when you're saying when you, you said that you were quite good professional of course you it, it, that's my idea you and other students are quite good at technical technicalities because th that's that's your world um, I, I cannot teach subtitling because you, you know more than me for example mm -hmm. in terms of how to interact with the technology uh, I'm from a different uh, uh, um, age but but um, so if someone hires someone with your profile that would be la creme de la creme that, that, that's be okay and you'll be easily domesticated to work standardized to work according to those patterns where you are expected to fulfill one specific job yes. and suddenly you will be only doing post editing or quality control just imagine most of our uh, um, translation agencies agencies they are using neural machine translation so what is the purpose of translating they are not translating what they are doing is the pre-translation process is over translation is being digested by uh, some machine and then what you're doing is looking at the output of machine translation and then you will be like in a textile company um, trying to detect flaws errors quality control right and that's quite mechanic yes i felt the same at the time that if i had continued in that field in that field specifically in that company or with the portuguese subtitling agency i would be very easily framed mm -hmm. in my case they didn't even s categorize the errors okay. they just said this is your file it has dozens of errors or like dozens of errors mm -hmm. and it was like spacing commas commas i did not agree with some Oops. some changes i did not agree with and you, you did not agree with because you you've learned English and you know how to, well, English and, or Portuguese, of, of course, okay, and and you know how to use commons in in, in Portuguese. So and there's a prontuario, there's a style guide, there's a dictionary, there's a grammar, there are reference books where, where you can easily say, okay, you do not put the, the the comma here or there or whatever. So, yeah, but anyway, the question that you bring about the neural networks is very interesting since when i was standing with you so let's say one decade ago there was already google translate obviously yeah. Yeah. i think deep l was starting to be developed but mm -hmm. it was rough it was not very good and the idea that existed at the time was that these things the computer assisted translations Cut. I believe this was a technical term. Yeah, cut tool. Yeah. Yeah. These cut tools, they kind of work, but not really. So if you, they don't really give you any answer. They can give you like a sense of what the text yeah. is about, but they will not translate it for you. And I feel that nowadays, they are very sure. good yeah. at translating. Like it, even the full text, not just sure, the idea, sure. but like sure. you put something there, mm -hmm. and it comes out almost very sure. good. Sure. And I think that sooner or later, translators will be replaced. Um, Maybe. What do you think? Maybe. Okay. One thing. Uh, one thing is 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 to um, use Google Translate, and that's machine translation. The other thing is to use a cat tool. A cat tool is not exactly the same as a w w some translation. Uh, machine translation because a cat tool is a specific tool designed for human interaction and it does not involve machine translation per se it's like a software, right? yes it's a software like memoq like sdl tradus uh, omega t uh, and other um, transit so a cat tool is the translator's best friend why because you can a cat tool is computer aided or assisted translation 
It means that it's a software specially designed to help translators because it uh, organizes the work according to project management scheme. It will organize it according to theme, topic, field, speciality, language, and so on. And it works based on memory. It works based on the concept of translation memory. And translation memory is like our own memory. It tends to grow the more or the better it is fed. So you have, you have translation memories and you have terminology or term bases. It means that if you are investing your uh, uh, work in or working in the automotive industry where a specific uh, customer is just adding let's let's look at bmw okay um if you want to um publish the operating manual or instruction manual of this um car a new a new, a new prototype for example um, you will be using the former translation memory. Right, that it's it, a database in a way. It's a database, but it works by detecting matches and telling you if you are, if they found, they or the software found a 100% match, 75% match, 50%. 30 based on something which has been stored right. previously in the in memory but the, the, uh, the that's one thing machine translation of course can be trained you can train the engine it's called engine okay and it, you, you you can train and add data and it works quite well with institutional, technical, specialized texts where there's a whole bunch or a series of corpus or corpora available. Let's look at the uh, Europe or European Parliament uh, directives and so on. And you can easily use or recycle that, leverage that for future reference. So. When every time people ask me to translate something into English, I will use as a pre-task um, uh, this machine translation, and then I will add my flavor to the uh, text based on my experience, reference, terminology. In this case, when you are asked to translate these kind of technical tests mm -hmm. for which there is a large corpus. Yeah. Could we argue that at the fundamental level, the process you described for the CAT tools mm -hmm. of identifying a segment and looking in your database for a similar uh, passage, yeah. mm -hmm. would, could you say that is a, something that we humans do at the fundamental level? Like we read a text, we recognize the words in the text because yeah. we know the language mm -hmm. and then we search our memory yes. for equivalents yes. for that. Yeah. So a, a neural network, the sure. engine you called, sure. Sure. probably does the same. Of course. So it looks at equivalents and then say, okay, yes. what is the best solution? And since if they are doing this fundamentally the same thing, mm -hmm. so identify, looking for a memory and coming up with an answer, I think that it's just a question of time until these neural networks do it better than us because yes. they have a better memory and they are better they at recognizing. Memory, but they, they don't have well. It, it's, it's, it looks like a cliche, but they, they don't have they don't have emotion emotions or and feelings and and they don't they don't understand context. And I, I think context well context context it, it's what what we are witnessing here or experiencing. Okay, it's the context. Looking at that AP, AP, it's uh, Andre Pacheco. Okay, and it's context. Um, and I, I tend to look at this like 
this movie Slam Dog Billionaire. Yeah. Th there's a lot of memory and experience being accumulated, and um, I don't know if the machine will be able to uh, detect that. Let, let let me give you one one example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, one of my students used machine translation to translate or pre-edit um, something taken from a video game. Uh, and the instruction was, uh, make sure the green ticks are on. Okay, ticks like ticking a box. So you we were um, uh, trying to, well, dealing with param parameters and, and with the game, okay. And uh, she swear, uh, uh, according to her, to her, the translation was, certifique que as carraças verdes <laughs> estão vivas, okay? So, oh, that was good, actually. That was good. Why? Yes, because... Let's, yes. Let's, sorry, let's just clarify that in Portuguese, tick is the, is the, well, I have to say, is a bug that it, attaches the, to dogs yes. that sucks their blood. Yes. So when she's, when the translation said the these bugs are vivas. Yes, they are alive, alive. Yes. not green, because the original yes. was yes. this box tick is green, but it turns out, okay, sure. this bug is alive. So it was good in that sense. Yes, that yes, definitely. If it was, it was interpreted as an animal. It was really, really good. But the problem is that there was this image associated with the text. So machine translation was not, not able to associate this with the functional level. Right. You said that the algorithms cannot detect contact. Would it, it be fair to say these algorithms cannot detect context yet? Yet, yes. Yeah. That's the thing. If you look at the progression line yes. from 10 years ago or 15 years or 22 now, it's the incredible. More, the more you feed this, the better. Um, and, and with AI, artificial intelligence, uh, speech recognition, for example, uh, one of the things that worries me is that sometimes people are not expecting top level quality or top notch quality. They, some people just, well, they just need average like quality. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I so for what, sure. what, how, uh, what, what, what's the use of investing your cognitive effort to provide a top-notch um, translation, if your uh, um, client will um, expect just the gist, the draft translation, just to understand what is going what is going on. Yeah, I feel that's so, also so the case most of the times, even for things like labels or instruction sure, manuals. Sure. If you sure. automate all that, I sure. think no one will. Sure. Notice sure. the difference, sure. even. Or so it's it, it's a it's it's a question of being able to balance, manage your effort, and read your uh, um, reader or or e e the 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 target audience. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I I really think it's just a question of time until translators become sort of irrelevant. I, that's the thing. I felt. I should not invest a lot in this field in a way because it's boring since I don't see myself translating seven hours a day. It's one of, very one of the things is, is boredom, uh, of course, Pe people are not, but, but it depends. Uh, it, it, it depends Be because if, if you, well, if, if you have the knowledge, the skills, the technology, you will be able to earn a lot, but I will not be say that you will be rich as in the past. I don't think so. But, I don't think you get a lot of money. But if you invest in post editing, for example, localization, communication, technical writing, for example, uh, other domains which are associated or spin offs of translation they will be adding extra value and yes for sure i'm not saying that it's not available or cannot be profitable i'm just saying that for me personally 
it was very tough if I had to deal seven or eight hours a day with text and editing text. One thing is if you are writing text, and that is also very tiring if you're writing so many hours, but to always correct text, that's something I felt I didn't enjoy doing for a long time. But I also did not feel there was a big future on the long scale. Because of this, I I felt that sooner or later, Mm -hmm. these algorithms will be better than me at doing this. So then how do I stay relevant? Okay, you can say you had this post editing, you had this localization, but what happens when the algorithms catch up and they are better at you at interpreting context? Or even if they are not better all the time, they are more consistent. And they are more consistent to the point that for an employer, it's more profitable to use these pre- uh, these pre-translations and then assume the risks. Not. But I, I, don't, I don't want to be pessimistic. Uh, but Otherwise, it's my job. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's no, but, and I, I, really, I really love translating. And I really like the way I see myself as better than machine. And it, it's, it's like those, um, those um, uh, uh, utopias or dystopias of the 19th century where, where like Jules Verne and so on, where, where we're being, or the world of the worlds and so on, and machine, ear one, uh, Samuel Butler, that it's, it's quite interesting, the revenge of the machines. But I, I really like to, like this symbiotic uh, 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 approach and... Um, or prosthetics, or whatever. <laughs> but I, I really like to test, and and at the end of the day, I say I'm better than you. Uh, Again, th- yet, or for now, or still better than you. I still, I still think that I can add something uh, different. Well, my personality, my feeling, my 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 worldview, my my. Let's awareness. frame the question in another way. You, of course, that you enjoy a lot your profession. You have lo- built a career on it, mm-hmm. both at the professional level, at the academic level. You're very experienced and you started to research these and to translate some decades ago. Mm-hmm. But let's put, let's frame the question from the perspective of your 18 year old students mm-hmm. who are now initiating a career in translation mm-hmm. by initiating the studies. Where do you see them 10, 15, 20 years from, from now? Yeah. Uh, do you feel like there's a role for them even? Uh, I, I, feel, I feel that there's a new role for them. Otherwise, they will, if they, the, in my first class, uh, I always say the same thing. Translation is not enough. So uh, if you take things for granted and granted and you think that you will make a, a living of out of um, how to uh, uh, translating documents of course it won't be enough full stop um, I will not um, see them well I'll, I'll see them as parts of these uh, of, of a huge machine uh, where they adjust or um, would, would they just be expected to provide routine routine boring tasks yeah. but it's up to them because it it, it there's quite good money there uh, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't or I don't, will there be that's the thing, like how much, what they will be paid will be proportional to their work and to their value that they had. If there is an algorithm that does 90% of what they do, I think mm-hmm. the employers will pocket the money or, 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 or yes, some free things can happen. Either the price of translation drops dramatically. Mm-hmm. So it already has. Yeah, okay. So, but theoretically, so either the price drops or the price stays the same mm-hmm. and the employer's pocket mm-hmm. or the price stays the same and the translators pocket the money, mm-hmm. which I think it's the l- less likely scenario. Yes. The problem is that, is, is that uh, the market is so um, um, structured in, in, in a way that 
you have these big service providers and they outsource and outsource and re-outsource yeah. and suddenly we, we have these roller coaster uh, 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 where um, the end uh, you it's not the end user but the end or the, the last part of the um, section will be the translator and then you will be dividing cost through different levels and the output would be quite short so intermediaries sucking so, the money yes yes and there are lots of intermediaries not only in an average uh, agency but also those platforms where you uh, register yourself as a provider freelance and you'll be involved in this uh, um, chain of uh, reaction where um, everything would be uh, split in segments so again coming back to the issue what do you think that will happen like the sh the current translators will evolve into another role and they will need to diversify their functions to yes attract the income and to attract yeah, the value. I, I, th I think uh, uh, I, th I think that well th there's one interesting uh, article by one of uh, scholar in translation st studies scholar and he calls translator the homo transference <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay and, and, and I, th I think we are dealing with a lot more than translation um, I'm not comfortable with the designation or the, the notion of translation services provider probably language services provider I, I don't like those um, the, the the way you we use buzzwords to describe our profession like intermediary or multicultural communication because an engineer is solid and consistent and you are an engineering full st an engineer full stop you are you are not uh, technical of engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know what uh, you know, I so know, what, I know. what I'm saying. So I know, and it, it comes down to the definition of professional field. If the professional field is not consolidated, you will be vulnerable, and you will be um, asking other professionals professions to give you words to describe your uh, uh, like, for example, communication. Communication is a social social sciences word, and then is it multilingual communication, multicultural, multi or yeah, yeah, yeah. inter multi, uh, and suddenly it it is too vague and not consistent to describe the field. Of course, it's not translator, according to the that ISO standard. A translator is a person who translates, which is rubbish. Okay, but then they coined a new definition, which is translation service provider. So, um, communication, of course, multilingual, of course, but there are other domains like content writing, uh, um, audiovisual, um, other. I, I don't know if we will still be relevant even in those things like even now okay we say content writing we are very good at making movies we're good at making series and plays and I think that will also be replaced sure. like I think that you can give an algorithm sometime in the future let's say your five seasons of your favorite show let's say people are unhappy with Game of Thrones how it ended mm -hmm. and you say here have the first eight seasons sure make me an ending in which that is unpredictable and makes me stay on my share. Mm -hmm. And I think that, or I believe, that these algorithms will be able to construct sure. these endings, so they will be able to write a story. And once yeah. they do this enough, they will be able to write their own stories and their own dramas. Mm -hmm. So even in content creation, I think we will lag behind. And fundamentally, again, I think that there is nothing, theoretically, that we can do better than them. 
meaning that they will be able to do everything like us or better than us. But even if it's like us or slightly worse than us, as you also said, in the translation field or in the communicating, I don't know now which term to use, mm -hmm. it will be enough for most people. Yeah, it, so will it matter? Even if they are not as good as us, if they are almost as good as us, mm -hmm. will that not be enough to displace us or the professionals? I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, d I, d I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, I like... I like this positive to end the, okay, to have this uh, uh, positive note on the future, but I know that uh, our jobs are being threatened by. Uh, Even if the jobs are not, at least the economy around the jobs is. And the economy, it, 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 that's that, that, that's good. Uh, the economy and also professional, uh, the, the profession, because if your professional is not is not recognized as such there are that there's nothing to help you yeah. to structure your uh, field for example the example the, the the problem you had with this agency if if you had something to report or someone to report to or give advice on your, yes, your for sure. Would, 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 yes. Be, would, would be more. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. There's no authoritarian body. There's no uh, like union or anything. Yeah. So and again, you're vulnerable. And again, that, that's that's interesting because um, suddenly, well, suddenly, translation is used for everything. Just look at the way this uh, lawsuit. Uh, involving uh, the um, that guy in southern South Africa. Uh, I don't know. Rendeiro. Ah, okay. Okay. The Portuguese banker that is now Portuguese being arrested in South banker, Africa. Banker, yes. They put the blame on the translator for delays in submitting the proceedings. So from the banker's side? From the banker's side, they claim that Portugal didn't or delayed, was in fault for not providing the translation on time for the court. Is that a question of translation or is that a problem of bureaucracy? No, it's, 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 it's our typical Portuguese problem uh, of approach of putting the blame on something, someone else. Some, uh, I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I still am, I'm, I'm still the president of, of Conselho Nacional de Tradução, the Portuguese National Council. And uh, we still didn't have the opportunity to discuss sworn translation or the status of legal translators interpreters with the ministry of well, law okay um so there's a problem there and every time we wanted to um discuss this with them we always felt that we were the um weakest link Right, so like you feel that these interpreters have no protection, like sure. legal protection. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, it, it, it had to do with submarines, uh, Paul Porter's submarines, and with, with Germany. Uh, the problem was also they put the blame on translation, on, on the translation. So, because um, they know it's the guy no one is going to protect. Yeah, yeah. and, and they, it's, it's easy to, to, to blame them. Um, say, okay. Translation is difficult, and and suddenly the they had this translated in in, in in two days or whatever. So so it's it's more it's it has, it has to do with political, institutional, uh, professional. Right, but if the field is becoming more plural, also as you say, like people need to 
assume these new roles, mm -hmm. doesn't that further dilute the professional identity, which makes it less likely to be consolidated? Yes, yes, that, that, that's, that's a problem. Uh, because people, uh, I had this experience here at, at university, uh, people claiming to know how to translate just because they came from a communication or uh, a journalism degree. Uh, and I tested them, and, and their translations were awful. So it's not a matter of being able to communicate. Uh, it's, it's something else, because they wanted to communicate okay, but suddenly there was something lacking or missing, like uh, phraseology, terminology, consistency. All right. Since you said that you enjoyed science fiction, you recited this War of the Worlds. Mm -hmm. Let's maybe close this up with a sci-fi question. Mm -hmm. Would you think that it will be possible sometime in the future to put a device on an animal, let's say your pet, your dog, mm -hmm. your cat, and then the machine will translate it for you? So the question is, do you think it will be someday possible to translate the thoughts or the emotions or the intentions, even if we don't speak the language, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. That's, that's quite interesting because uh, yesterday I was reading something on Facebook and I think it was that to do with a, some sort of software being able to translate pigs or pig really? speech. I, I, really? Yes, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I, I can check it. Does that have to do with the brain implants that Neuralink probably, is doing? Probably. But in, mm, but that's different. I don't think they translated it. For instance, what Neuralink was doing is that they could predict the pig's movement. But I don't think it had anything to do with language or communication. I don't, I don't know. I don't, it was just something that I... I okay, I, okay. I, I thought it was completely on, out of the blue. But on, on, <laughs> on the train, okay. Um, maybe. So like, there's a thing, like, if you, it's, even it's, if you don't use words, what is there to translate? It's quite, it's quite frightening to, to, to look at, uh, at the way things are evolved. I, I really would like to know more about it. And, and some of, one of my research topics is cognitive process studies. What happens in the brain and how we can tailor, domesticate, master uh, things. So it will probably be, and suddenly we'll, you will have or need to hire a peak translator. Or <laughs> and it's scheduled to be a machine. Like it is not something anything. It's not something humans yeah, but, can do, right? Okay, but the, you, you you need the this human side to translate your pet's emotions <laughs> <laughs> instead of machine. You want to remain positive, saying yeah, yes, there will I, be I, a I, human I sometime in the process. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> That means to be I really completed. think. I've All right, that's and kind of a message of hope for the future. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, uh, let's close this up. Perhaps it was an honor to talk to you and yeah. to see that you're still as funny as you were yeah. back then. Thank, Thank you very you much Andre. for coming. It was a pleasure. Take care. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Bye, Fox. You're welcome.